we have none of us, we, however much we may want to pride ourselves as English speakers, we don't live the language. The truth is that here in India we continue to live the language that is our mother tongue. Um, if it comes to emotional connect, for me it's Bangla. I am never moved by English as much as I am moved by Bangla. Um, and therefore, English is a learned language, it is not a lived language. And to be able to transfer the, the emotional content, the energy, the you know, all that goes into the words that are being chosen by the author, to transfer all of those into the target language is, is the toughest thing to And there is no one objective answer. You don't know if you've got it right. You just keep trying over and over again and you hope that you make it. Classic example is uh, Rabindranath Thakur himself. Rabindranath Thakur, when he wrote his prose, he, he didn't know restraint. He would pile on metaphors and images till he was blue in the face. You know, the thought was clear from the first uh, couple of phrases, but he just went on and on, piling it on, relentlessly almost. And yet, he had a lightness of touch that allowed this uh, not to become florid. But if you started translating the content into English phrases, it became a uh, truck, you know? The heart of, the, you know, the sky of my soul and the garden of my emotions. I mean, you, you cringe. You, you do a very faithful job and then you cringe at what you produce. And most of all you cringe because you have completely lost his likeness of touch. Because, you know, Bangla is a very economic language, economical language, for one thing, it, uh, it, it's not, uh, many words are just two syllables or three syllables, they are not polysyllabic. They contain much more, that it's much more of, a, all Indian languages are like that, they are much more condensed than English is. Indian languages don't require verbs in their sentences to be complete sentences. You can have perfect sentences without using verbs in them, right? You can, you know, you cannot do that in English, so you immediately start making it wordy. So this is, you know, uh, as you said, it's a challenge, it's a mathematical puzzle which you then set yourself to solve late into the night, you crack yourself, you know, I have to get it right and it becomes almost a, it's a battle with the author <laughs> and then you curse the author and say, why did you do this? And, and, and yet you can't, you can't say, okay, fine, I'll just simplify it, you can't do that either. So, and at some point, you know, there's a moment of epiphany. Usually for me, it happens at about 2.30 in the morning, when I click, I don't know why. And, and I get something that I think works. But it's a continuous struggle. It, it never ends. And then each author comes up with his own, own version of it. So then, challenge number two. What kind of English do you translate into? Here I am translating people who, Hong Kim Chandra, who wrote Yudhya Shandini, published in 1864. Thereabouts, and then you have uh, Navarro Bhattacharya, who is published in 1993. What? How do I differentiate the English? What kind of English do I use for a book written in 1864? Do I use the English that was spoken then? Spoken by whom? Spoken in India? Spoken in in England? Spoken in America? And I don't even know those languages. I don't know how they spoke English back then. I don't even know how they spoke English back then in India. I can't claim to know. So I solve it by saying, look, every writer writes for a contemporary audience. I mean, I'm sure they don't wrote for plus, for posterity. Even. He only he could have said, Adi or So you know, he knew 100 years on they would be reading his works. <laughs> but most people write for contemporary audiences. So I, so I decided, fine, let's we will use a contemporary language here today in the year 2010 and 2011. It, not faddish, but contemporary. So that's problem number two. Problem number three is um, um, invectives. Indian languages have such beautiful, colorful invectives. They, they're rich in content, they're rich in their references, the way they call into question the genealogy of your family and your relationship with the world and the universe. <laughs> It's beautiful. I mean, you know, in in, uh, in Bangla, for example, Bangla is arguably the only language I think in the world where people are reviled for making love to idiots. There is a word for it. Yeah, you sleep with an idiot. That's how 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 lousy you are. Now imagine trying to get that into English. Then, of 
course, there are the challenges of cultural habits, which are not unique to Bangla, but perhaps India as a whole. You know, for example, one of the things we have, a, a very tender gesture in India is what we say in Bangla, Hat Guliya Dewa, you know, to do this. So, Hat Guliya Dewa is literally to very lightly run your fingertips over someone's, say, even face. Right? Imagine saying that in English. It's a sexually aggressive act, <laughs> right? Can you imagine trying to convey tenderness and care by saying he ran his fingers lightly over the cheek? Kades, but a kades is, is is a different thing, right? It's not it's not an avuncular act. It's not a mother parental act. It's a very romantic act. How do you do it? Then there are words words like man, for example, moan, which is this unique blend of heart and mind, it's a continuum. It, it's heart at one end and mind at the other and sometimes you're somewhere here, 70 mind, 30 heart, sometimes the other way down, depending on the context. And in English you're so, you're so hamstrung. You either have to use heart, you have to use mind, sometimes you pop out and you use soul, which is like really the praise. Mon <laughs> you know. exactly. As a matter of fact, there are, yes, there are states of mind which do not exist in English. Mon Kamon, exactly. You know, it, it's that elusive feeling of sadness, which I can you imagine every time saying she felt an elusive feeling of sadness. <laughs> you can't, right? And, and you know, these are shorthands for an entire cons emotional construct that the reader relates to the moment he or she sees that original phrase. And then sometimes you just turn it into English by using something quite different because you know, ultimately what you try for is emotional feeling. You do not always try for, obviously not literal, but sometimes you do not even try for corresponding um, idioms or corresponding phrases. You just try to hit at that same place in the one as the original does and you hope you get it right. So when I started thinking of all this, I got very worried. And um, I thought, I, you know, this is it, I should stop because there is never in any way that I can do justice to the original. And this was particularly exasperated by the fact that, you know, there were writers who, when I was living with authors, when I told them, hey, you know, I have translated your book. And he said, yes. No, you know, your book, this book. I said, oh, okay, fine. And then he turned the way to talk to someone else. And then you realize that, you know, to some people it makes no difference. The authors are not interested. And then, Today, we also find that what's happened is that the market has inevitably taken over even when it comes to translations. And now, um, there are writers in Bangla who are in their 30s and 40s who are in constant touch with me. When are you doing my story? When are you doing my novel? When are you doing my book? And then you realize that these people are going to be far more demanding. So, while earlier the challenge was only about meeting your own standards of um, fealty, now you have the original writer also sitting, waiting in the wings to, to make sure that you've got it right. And recently I had an exchange with one of the um, contemporary writers who works I translated, Rupert told me, you haven't got it. This guy is very unsure of himself. The way you've written it makes him sound so confident. That was excellent input, so back I went and tried to inject uncertainty into his words and phrases. But you just realize that, you know, the, the more you work on it, the more difficult it gets. It doesn't get any easier. But, you, speaking for me, I keep trying to push the envelope. Look for harder and harder texts to translate. Look for bigger challenges. And um, I know I might fail, but I want to fail more spectacularly than, than before. <laughs>